Doc G, welcome to Point of Impact. It's you know, too honored to have you on. I am so happy to be here, Aaron, and can't wait for this conversation. You know, I've been looking for this, and I've heard you on uh, your podcast, as well as guest appearing on some of my other favorite podcasts. And, uh, you know, I, I haven't finished the book, but uh, I am, I love everything you're putting out. It really hits home because, of course, I was accidentally thrust into, so to speak, into the fire uh, when I was injured and you know, I, I had to retire early from my, my job. And, of course, the pension, uh, disability, medical retirement, whatever you want to call it, it gave me just enough to live. So technically, I was financially independent and retired early. And the question was, then what? And I, I thought I had it all planned out, but I really didn't. So uh, finding your book, finding your podcast, and all of it, uh, it's very meaningful to me. And I can't wait to share your story um, with with our audience. That Thank you said, so much. And oh. I was going to say, thank you so much. And it, the then what question is such a huge question, right? And it's amazing how we don't think about it until we're there. Right. And that's the thing about financial independence or, you know, FI, FI, FIRE, FIRE, is that world circle around money, trading time for money, working towards retirement. And then what? Well, uh, money becomes the goal and once you reach the goal or once you trade all the time then what but in your book taking stock you talk about different needs uh, uh, with uh, and that uh, financial independence only helps you realize those other needs before we get into that i want to ask you though i'm very curious how you got into a field as a doctor where <laughs> where uh, it's it's actually expected that you never save a a, a, a patient <laughs> and and then of course how that you, know, you made the transition from hospice care into this financial education. So interestingly enough, I think I was built to be a hospice doctor. When I was seven years old, my father died suddenly. He had a brain aneurysm. That's a blood vessel in the brain that burst. And he was a doctor at the time. He was, believe it or not, rounding at the hospital when this blood vessel burst. He was taken to the emergency room within 24, 48 hours. Uh, he was declared brain dead and we removed life support. So it was a very quick thing. I was seven years old. And at the time, I didn't understand why it had happened. And like most seven-year-olds, I looked at things through the lens of myself, right? We're very self-absorbed at that age. And so I figured that I did something wrong, that it was my fault that he had died because I wasn't enough. And so I spent a lot of time as a young kid trying to figure this out, trying to make sense of this story. And eventually I told myself that... The way to make up for this was if I became a doctor like him, if I stepped into his shoes and could help people the way he was helping people, it would somehow psychically fix this feeling of responsibility for what happened. So I was thrust into this idea of being a physician. I had a learning disability at the time. So the likelihood was I was reading way below kids at my grade. It was kind of an audacious thing to think, oh, I'm going to become a doctor. But that carried me. I got over my learning disability, went to high school, college, eventually medical school, and when I was in medical school, my first year, the, one of the first things I did was volunteer in the inpatient hospice unit at Northwestern University. The first patient I ever saw was actually a hospice patient. And it made sense because when I was a little kid, there was no one there to really help us and tell us how to feel or, or, or help us through this. So volunteering for hospice, dealing with death and the dying felt very natural for me because that was something that I, I experienced with my father but also like most young people, as opposed to building a career around that, I eventually decided that I wanted to do other things. I wanted to do general internal medicine. I went out and started practicing and eventually burned out. And that was when I discovered financial independence or the fire movement. And I realized if I could make enough money, I could leave medicine forever. And that was, that was perfect. 
And in fact, by the time I recognized what fire was, I was pretty much there. But like most people, I wanted to be sure. So I started doing some side hustles. And one of those medical side hustles was actually becoming a hospice doctor. So I had multiple patients who needed hospice care, and I would consult the hospice team. And at some point, they looked at me and they said, you're really good at this already. You call us and you've already done the things we would suggest. Why don't you come work for us? So I started working as a hospice medical director, very part-time, almost as a side hustle to maybe make a little extra money, make sure I was safe. And I found that I loved it. And as I was realizing I was financially independent, I could start getting rid of the parts of my job I didn't like. And so I call that the art of subtraction. I eventually started subtracting out the being on call and the late night hours and the owning my own practice. And what I was left with was doing very much part-time hospice work, which I loved, but it opened up my free time. I had all sorts of time now to start pursuing other things that I was passionate about. And I had never really thought about what am I passionate about until I had this free time. And that led to me going down the rabbit hole of financial independence because that was what gave me this freedom. But it allowed me to write. So I started a blog and I'd always been a writer in my previous life, but I had never given enough time or energy to it because I just didn't feel like it was a reasonable use of my time. I thought I was supposed to be spending my time making money as a doctor. And so I started writing about finances. It led to a podcast. I started interviewing these people on my podcast, these experts in personal finance and real estate and entrepreneurship. And a lot of times we basically got to the point of why, why are you doing this? What does this do for you? How does this all relate to happiness? And we'd struggle through these conversations, even with these experts, but I started getting answers from a place I never expected, which was my hospice patients, my hospice patients being told that they were terminally ill, that they had weeks or months to live all of a sudden looked at life through a much clearer lens. And they were able to drop society's expectations, their family's expectations. They were able to let go of all that they thought they quote unquote should do and started thinking about what did they really want to do? What truly brought them happiness? What did they not have the courage to explore? And it just hit me that those are the exact same conversations we should be having with young people when we're talking about our finances. So that led to a book, Taking Stock, which is all about what the dying can teach us about money and life. And it was like both of my li- different pieces of my life coming together in one place. And you, you do mention this in, in the book about uh, doing a life review. And it's it, similar to what, what your hospice patients uh, go through once they learn they have, they're, they're terminal. But you recommend, of course, doing it far earlier. And that's what, what, what is a life review? What, what does it entail? And, and um, how can you use it earlier on in life to, to find that purpose? So life review is a structured series of questions that often we go through with dying hospice patients, right? So after we manage some of their comfort, make sure they're where they want to be, manage their nausea and their pain. A lot of times we start talking to them about their lives. And so a life review is a structured series of questions where they can go back and look at their lives and ask some really important things like what was important to them? What did they accomplish? What didn't they accomplish? Who were those important people in their lives? What were their most exciting and fantastic moments? What were their worst moments? And then we ask them about the present and future. What do they feel like they still need to accomplish? If they had more time, what would they be doing right now? If they felt physically better, what would be a good use of their time? All of these questions help people come to terms with their life and what they've accomplished and not accomplished. There's a whole series of questions. And if you go to Google and you put in hospice life review, you can come up with all sorts of lists of questions. But the idea is... Can we take some time, look at our life and start asking those deeper questions about what was important to us? And so what I often tell people is if you want, you know, the thumbnail or the thumb sketch version of what a full life review is, you can ask yourself one question, which is, if I found out I was going to die in the next few months, what would I always regret never having the energy, courage or time to do? And I think it's a great place to start anchoring a sense of purpose. A lot of people tell me, It's great. You talk about purpose all the time and you should live a life of purpose, identity, and connections. But people say, hey, I don't know how to find my purpose. A life review is a good way to start in a structured way, looking at what you've been through, what you've accomplished, and what you want to accomplish, and start putting that into terms in such that you can start building a life around these important things 
the sense of purpose. So it's a, a good way to really start thinking about purpose or at least asking those important questions because purpose for many people is a black box and many struggle with ways of figuring out what their purpose should be. You ask the question and, and, and frame it with, if you didn't have enough, if, if you didn't have the energy, time or courage to accomplish it. You, what you didn't say there, what you definitely left out was enough money. But so many people, we use that, we all use that experience. If only I had more money. Why is it that you didn't, you didn't, you don't, you don't frame it like that? When you don't, you don't word it in the phrase, you know, if you learned that you're you know, going to die in the next couple of months, what would you regret not having done if you had enough money? The truth of the matter is I think money is just not as important. Just as when you have enough money and you're financially independent, it doesn't solve all your problems. Not having enough money doesn't keep you from doing all the things you want to do. So the truth of the matter is when I really talk to people and I experience this with the dying often, it was almost never money that kept them from doing the things they want to do. It was usually that they didn't have the courage to do it, or they thought they didn't have the time to do it, or they were afraid they were going to fail. So fixing, for instance, relationships in your life usually doesn't cost much money. Pursuing a hobby or a passion, writing a book, starting a sport, all of these things that people find important in their lives, almost none of that needs money. Yes, there are probably examples of people who wanted to do something very specific and they needed money to do it. But most of the time, money is secondary. Even people who say, I needed money to go travel because it was my bucket list item to go to this place. But it's not usually that going to the place that really brings you purpose. It's being the kind of person who wants to go to the place. So in other words, I'm interested in adventure and excitement and travel. So I might not have enough money to go to Europe, but I probably could do a road trip throughout the U.S. and still fulfill some of that sense of purpose without spending as much money. And so I think hmm. money is tangential. Money is a tool and it is true. To, it is a tool that can help us work on our sense of purpose. But we also have to realize that there are many, many other tools that are non-monetary, right? So we have our communities, we have our energy, we have our youth, we have our relationships, we have our intelligence, right? We have our can-do attitude. All of these are also tools. And so if you don't have a lot of tool that is money, you might have some of these other tools. And so what I really would like people to start thinking about is how can I start using some of those other tools in the absence of money to still pursue this sense of purpose? I like how you, you put it in the, um, use the example of money being more like a resource, like oxygen. You know, you never notice when you have enough of it, but you definitely notice as soon as you have too little. It, and there's a that, 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 that saying that you don't, your money doesn't bring happiness. In fact, there was a study done that there's a certain income level, of annual income level that uh, if you're within, was it 75 to 150, I don't remember, 150,000, uh, you have enough satisfaction in life but below that or even above that it begins that happiness and satisfaction level begins to diminish uh it, did you you find this with your hospice patients did you have you learned this through your podcast or your you know, your other experiences so what you're talking about is the study with Kahneman and Deaton and it was done can't remember. I think it was in the 90s. And there have been some follow-up studies that have further detailed the connection to money and happiness. But ultimately, what I'll tell you is sitting in rooms with dying hospice patients, they almost never say, I wish I had made more money. They almost never say, I wish I had worked more nights and weekends. Often the things that they were concerned with had very little to do with money. I wish I had the courage to try that thing that was so important to me, or I wish I had fixed that relationship, or I wish I had spent more time consistent with the person who I wanted to be, right? Like I wish I'd spent more time building myself into the person who I wanted to be as opposed to following the directions, spending time at a job I didn't like, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's true that money can help. And there's certainly when you have very, very little money, it makes it harder to be happy. 
but it's never enough, right? Money is never going to be enough to be happiness. You're always going to need other things. You've alluded to, I think you've mentioned uh, Mr. Money Mustache, another uh, personality in the um, financial independence realm. And he put it in a way that uh, I always liked, uh, where um, it wasn't about making enough money so you could quit working. It's about not needing the money and the work being even more fulfilling because you didn't need it. What is it about finding purpose or what are the basic building blocks for living that fulfilling life? Um, I think, I think you said something about uh, purpose, identity, and connection. Connection. Can you explain yeah. a little bit more about that? Sure. So purpose, identity, connections, this idea that understanding what drives you, who you are, and then using those things to build relationships, connections, and community with other people is really what I think happiness is, right? And we can use different terms, right? Some people say happiness. You can talk about um, quality of life. Some people say, you know, self-actualization. We all have these different terms for whatever we call this contentedness, right? And so when it all comes down to it, I think contentedness or happiness really has two main components, right? One is meaning and the other is purpose. Meaning is about how we cognitively think about our past. It's the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and what we've gone through. There can be no happiness if you look at your past and see yourself as a victim, right? If you see the past as bad and all these bad things happened to me and because these bad things happened to me, I never was able to be the person I wanted to be. If that's your outlook, if that's the way you interpret your past, if that's the meaning you find, you're not going to be a particularly happy person. On the other hand, if the story you tell yourself is, I went through all these really challenging things and I came out of them. And although I wouldn't want to go through them again, I became a better person who learned things and who is better today than they were yesterday because of all these difficult things. Then you're really telling yourself the hero story. And so when you understand meaning or your past, then it's much easier to approach your present and your future. And your present and your future are very purpose-oriented, not meaning-oriented, purpose-oriented, and they're very action-oriented. And so when I talk about purpose, identity, and connections, what we're really talking about is how in the present and the future you're going to build that life you want to build. And so you can't do that if you don't know what drives you, what excites you, what you're passionate about. That's purpose. You can't do that if you don't know who you are, right? So if I don't fundamentally know who I am or what's important to me, it's going to be really hard to find these anchors to build purpose around. And you can't do that unless you have connections. And what I love to say is connections and community are actually the award at the end of the game. They're the gold at the end of the rainbow. So as opposed to putting all your time worrying about building and community and connections, I actually tell people really work on meaning and purpose and purpose includes identity. If you really work on building a sense of purpose and identity into your life, you will naturally as a side effect create connections with other people and build community. When you are intentionally doing things that you're passionate about, other people see you and you join groups and you meet people and you develop teacher student relationships or mentor mentee relationships. And there's a lot of reciprocality and give and take, and you build these communities based on people seeing you doing things that light you up. And so community and connection is winning the game. It's actually the end point and it's a happy side effect. And it's not just me who kind of says this. If you look at the data, there's been plenty of data. When you talk about does money bring happiness, there's actually been plenty of longitudinal data about what makes people happy. In fact, the Harvard men's study, I think, has studied this group of men starting in the 1920s and just every year to interview them, interviewed the people they loved. They came to all sorts of conclusions. And one of the biggest conclusions they came to is it wasn't really money that bought people happiness. It wasn't achievements. It wasn't all those other things we think it is. It was the close relationships, the connections in the community you form. And so that's how I think it works. If we look at this kind of framework of what happiness is, it's meaning and purpose. Meaning is your past. Purpose is your present, which 
obviously is wrapped up in identity. And the whole idea behind purpose and identity is eventually you win the game by building communities and having connections with other people. I think that's what it, what it's all about. Where we left off, uh, we've defined, you know, we, 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 you've mentioned taking this as a life review, taking stock of, of your life, the course you're on and asking, yourself if your your current course is you know, the direction is it taking you where you want to go and certain aspects of having that fulfilling life like you said are that the purpose and identity self-actualization achievements and uh, most importantly is that sense of community and connection so let's say somebody performs they, we, we do that that the life review, right? We take stock of where we are, who we are, who we're with and what we're doing. And we're not on the course that uh, we want to be. What are some of the actions that we can take that first, those first steps towards making the, the corrections and living a life that won't leave us with as many regrets? So I think that's a wonderful question. And the reason why is when we do this purpose work, it's really clear that you don't necessarily find purpose, you create it, right? It's something you actually have to build and create. But we do have to look for how to what we're going to anchor this purpose in. What are some of the anchors to build a life of purpose around? And so that's what the life review is really good for. It's asking yourself these important questions so that you can then figure out what the anchors are and then create purpose around them. So for instance, when I did this life review myself, I realized that being a physician was no longer serving me. It no longer felt as purposeful. It wasn't what I strove towards. But I had a lot of regret around not writing a book. I had a lot of regret about not creating more content, whether that was writing or podcasting. It was building these places where I could have deeper conversations about things that were important. So that was my anchor, right? It was communication. Mm. It was writing. It was podcasting. Those were my anchors. But then I had to build a life around them. And so the question is, once you know what's important to you, there's an abundance of things you can do to start pursuing that life. For instance, I had someone who I did a life review with. This was someone who is not a dying patient, but someone in the, who had come to me from the financial world who was trying to kind of struggle with this idea of purpose. And we did a life review and we really talked a lot about her childhood. And one of the questions I asked her was, when you were a kid, what did you do that lit you up the most? And it took her a second and she was like, horses. I loved horses. And she had spent a lot of her childhood at the stables, grooming horses, teaching people to ride, even doing some minor competing. And then she got older and went to college and there was no stable close to her university. And then she had planned to do it after she started work. When she was a professional, she got into journalism, but never got back around to it. And through this conversation, we realized that horses were a huge part of her childhood, something she still occasionally even dreamed about. And she had totally let it go because she got too busy because it was expensive, what have you. So I had the very real conversation of, okay, you now have an anchor of something that feels like purpose in your life. You're not 100% happy with your job. You're feeling a little lost, but here's an anchor to start on. How do you then create a sense of purpose around that? And so we had a lot of discussions, right? She could start a podcast about horses. She could start a blog about horses. She could go and start practicing again at the stable. She could maybe teach because she was very, very good at it when she was younger and she still knew a lot of the theory behind it. So that became the question is like, okay, now there's an abundance of possibilities. What speaks to her? And for her, she would go and she eventually started volunteering at the stable on the weekends when she wasn't working. And that eventually led to her teaching some and that teaching led to a little extra income. And that little extra income actually allowed her to pull back on a job she didn't love as much. And so the question becomes, again, once you have these anchors, there's so many different ways to get back involved. The question is, are you willing to 
take the action. And so, yes, action is hard. It's really easy to think about something and know the right things to do. And it's sometimes hard to actually take those actions. But you can't even get to that point until you figure out what types of things excite you enough to start taking actions towards. And so I think the answer is there's tons of things you can do. The harder part is trying to figure out what excites you. Once you do that, then we can start looking at the thousands of different ways you can get back reinvolved with that thing that maybe you've lost or never had the courage to try. Yeah, uh, that's true. I, uh, courage is a huge aspect of that. Uh, we we grow these these roots or these you know, these walls around. We actually protect ourselves with that nine to five and make the excuses that we we have to you know, earn that money, we have to provide, and we just don't have the time or the money uh, to to pursue those things. Uh, so is that why you you, you started to, to, to write and you know, the blog and, and, and podcast about financial independence? Yeah, I mean, we use money as a mirage, right? It basically becomes a goal instead of a tool, and we make it a goal it blots out all those other things. And we do this on purpose because it's low hanging fruit. It's really easy for us to figure out how to make more money or how to get to our financial goals. It may be hard to do, but we can at least put it on paper, map it out, decide what it looks like and start working towards it. It's really hard to start thinking about who we want to be and what is purposeful in our life. In fact, I think it's anxiety provoking enough that we avoid it and keep on concentrating on things like work in our profession because it's easier. I think it's much, much harder to say, there's these things I want to do in life and life is limited and I may get to the end of my life and not have accomplished things. And that's a really scary idea. So as opposed to starting to jump on those things and doing them right now, I think we get anxious and afraid and we jump back to what's comfortable, which is the low hanging fruit. It's our jobs. It's our money. It's our careers. It's what society tells us we should be and is mapped out how we get there as opposed to the much more difficult stuff is like, what's meaningful to me? What does purpose look like? How do I live a life of purpose? This is very ephemeral compared to how do I make enough money to survive or how do I make enough money to retire? Or how do I become financially independent? Those things are much more knowable. So it's way easier for us to focus on those things. And it's very easy for us to say, I don't have enough energy or time. But I think in a lot of ways that becomes an excuse. Because if you're looking at your life and you're unhappy where you are today, your goal should be start filling up as much of that time with things you like doing and doing as little of things you don't like doing. So if you're like that person I was talking to who discovered that horses was important to her, Maybe she didn't have the financial wherewithal to leave her job yet, but she was still not doing things she liked on nights and weekends. So if she went and volunteered at the stables one night a week, all of a sudden that two hours was very purposeful, meaningful activity. And she hadn't had that in her life before. So even if she didn't stop working her job, even if she didn't cut down on her hours, she still has had a net gain in purposeful activities. And so Sometimes you're stuck and sometimes you do have to make money and sometimes you can't leave your job. And I'm not saying that means that you should do it anyway, but we should be really thoughtful about those other times, those free nights, those weekends. Remember I said, you know, we have different types of tools. A young person might not have as much money and they might be stuck in a job they don't like, but they have a lot more energy and free time than for instance, someone who's my age who has teenage kids and who has other new responsibilities like a mortgage and all sorts of other things. When you're 22 or 23 or 25, you might not have those things and you might have a lot more energy or time than I have. And so how do you use that tool to start doing more purposeful things, even if you can't get out of the nine to five? They seem like burdens, but they're also double as this, you know, self comfy blankets of protection against, like you said, the, the, anxiety producing uh, thoughts of, of self actualization, trying to define that, that identity and create your purpose that takes courage all on its own. Uh, even before the pursuit, just self-examination can be, can be, it, it actually think to, to think of it like that, to look directly at it. It seems so silly to say, but it does create that anxiety. Uh, so 
we don't we, we have all these things that do pile up yeah the the mortgage yeah paying for the groceries the the, the car bills and all that and i guess this come brings us all the way back to uh, financial independence why is it that we we are a consumer nation and we don't focus enough on that financial independence so that we can live the life that we're working so hard to attain. I mean, we live in a consumer based economy and we are constantly getting signals from everywhere we look that we should try to buy more, be more and achieve more. I mean, look at social media, you jump on Instagram and you're going to see people who are wearing the nicest clothes, going on the greatest vacations, driving the most expensive cars. You turn on your TV and if there are any advertisements there, they are made by advertisers, by marketers who are trying to create an appealing sense of purpose for you to pursue. Be like this ultra successful, wealthy, good looking person by buying this product. And so we are given these messages consistently that spending and luxury are what are going to make us be the kind of people we want to be. And it's all a lie. It's being sold to us because these companies want to make money. These influencers want sponsors. So they want to present you a certain lifestyle so that you buy into it. So there are a lot of people making money off of you spending. The other thing is spending creates good feelings. Let's be honest. You go on a nice vacation or buy a nice car or do all sorts of things or even you know buy an expensive meal. It does give you brief amounts of joy. The problem is we generally, I believe, have a happiness set, right? They call it habituation or we talk about hedonic adaption or the hedonic treadmill. Basically, we have a happiness set point, And when we do these kind of things, it increases our happiness set point briefly. But then we tend to habituate back to our baseline. I don't think we're stuck at that baseline. So maybe if a 10 is the most happiness in the world and zero is no happiness, maybe most of us start at a five and we buy something expensive or nice. It gets us to a seven or eight. But then we fall back to the five. I don't think that means that we're stuck at the five forever, but it means that if you really want to get up to a six or a 6.5, you're going to have to do some of the harder work. And that harder work is we were talking about the men's health study from Harvard or all the other studies. If you really want to get to that higher happiness set point, you've got to work on purpose, which eventually will build communities and connection. And so as opposed to the quick shot that gives you that brief bump of happiness, but it isn't long-term, we've got to do the harder work, which is developing a sense of purpose and identity, and then using those to build connections and community, to connect us to other people. That's how you go from a five to a six long-term or a five to a 6.5. I'm not Pollyanna. You're probably not going to get to a 10, uh, but you probably can bump up a few points and it can be a long-term bump if you do some of that much deeper, harder work. But to do that, you're going to have to see through what society is selling us. And that's hard. So the treadmill being you run and run and run and you end up in the same place. And there are these short-term purchases that are sometimes you know, figurative, sometimes literal sugar highs. Uh, might make you feel good in the interim, but they are quick, quickly worn off. It's like buying a new car. Eventually, soon enough, it becomes the car or the TV or whatever. But it makes us feel good. We burn off uh, that hard-earned money, and we got to go trade our more time for more money to go buy stuff. So... To, to get to this, this purpose-driven life, we're asking ourselves, we're taking stock, and we're, making, uh, we're taking you know, a life review. What are some of the things? Is there, is there a common thing that many of the people you've, you've come across with in your practice or uh, in you know, the financial independence education space that gives people that you know, greater sense of fulfillment and joy? You know, I think the, the common thing that I see in people who are dying is regret, but the regret depends on who the person was and what was important to them. 
right? And so what we're really aiming for is this idea of being more authentic and living a life that's more true to ourselves. but that's going to be different for every person. Like for me, I had to do some of that purpose and identity work to realize that being a writer and an author and a communicator was my most authentic self that I had been ignoring up to this point. And so that I had to start pursuing that, but that's me for you. It might be something completely different. And you will then pursue those things and hopefully that will bring you greater community and connection. So the only common point is that it's the regret that I see in the dying, which I think we see a lot in the young people, if they're willing to do this life review, is that they weren't doing those purposeful things earlier. But what that purpose is, is just it's different because we're all different people who have different interests. Uh, we mm -hmm. have some commonalities, but what's purpose to me might be different than what's purpose to you. Like for you, purpose might be building businesses that help other people thrive. That doesn't excite me as much as writing and having deeper conversations about things like purpose. For someone else, it might be playing a sport. For someone else, it might be working with the youth. For someone else, it might be trying to solve some of the bigger problems in the world, like pollution or global warming. Like each of us is different. And therefore, I think our sense of purpose is going to be different. And then finding that thing that we can use to build community and connections is going to be different. But the commonality is the regret. It's not building a sense of purpose and identity in the first place and then basing your activities off of it. Though there was a common thread that I, I, I noticed in each one of your examples there, though, was that even though for you it was the writing and, and uh, creating content, um, others, it was building businesses to employ others, uh, and, but everything else, all those other examples, it was in service of others. Is that something you come across more? Uh, do you find that people find that purpose and fulfillment in, you know, more selfless acts or do you, is it, is it really a mixed bag between selfless and selfish? Kind of as we were talking about, when you look at the long-term studies, it's the human connection, which tends to make me people more happy. So I think when living your life of purpose can touch other people, it's much more likely to bring you that community and connections, which I think is a lot likely, more likely to give you happiness. Could I imagine a world in which it didn't? Certainly. I mean, I, for instance, taking care of some artists and their sense of purpose and identity was very much connected to their art. And some of them you could lock in a room with a can with a bunch of canvases and they would be as happy as can be. But usually it's not just that thing that they loved, but it was that it put them in a community of artists and people who grew from each other and vibed off each other and ended up being coming close. So it doesn't have to be that way, but I think that's usually the end game or end goal. So it's not impossible. Some people just love something that's very solitary and that really fills them up. But I think that it's usually when those things add to a deeper sense of community. And I think a great way to build community is when you are doing something in service of other people, right? That's going to naturally build community. So I think that commonality tends to be there uh, because being of service to other people, I think just makes us feel good. And I think it connects pe us to other people and bonds us in a very special way. Uh, but I don't think it has to be there. I think it's just really common. What about the more uh, tactical side of uh, financial in independence? You know, you've did, we've talked about uh, taking you know, that that review of your life, finding you know, reconnecting with what was most exciting, you know, or what what excited you most, what was more fulfilling, and you know, sort of that uh, self actualization. And once we decide, you know, who and what we want to do, what if, what if the, the, you're, you're still, you know, like you said, kind of bogged down with uh, work, mortgage, the nine to five, all that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe there you have a lot of debt. Where does somebody start? And are there some best, best methodologies for achieving financial independence? 
so you said, what if you are still with your mortgage and those kinds of things? Not what if you will be right. So the idea, especially if we do this right, if we do this purpose and identity work in the beginning, it's the beginning so that we then decide what we're building a financial framework for. So the purpose and identity hopefully come first, but then we still have to build that financial framework, but we can build this financial framework in such a way that we can understand the trade-offs and make appropriate decisions based on that, right? So, and, and who you are, right? So once I have an idea of what purpose is, I can then look at my financial plan and say, what am I willing to do? Some people will say, I really love this idea of purpose, but I'm willing to push it aside because I think I'm going to live a nice long life and I'd like to pursue it when I have enough money to feel stable. So I'm going to work and grind it out and work really hard the next 10 years and put it aside because I won't have time for it, but I'm going to build up my strong finances so that at the end of 10 years, I can either retire or pull back or, or do whatever I need to do to create room for that purpose. And so that's what the traditional fire pathway looked like. And that was what people really beginning in the 2000s, started to think of as fire, work really hard at a job I don't like, make a lot of money, quit my job, and then do what lights me up. That was kind of the old way. But now a lot of people are saying, you know, I don't only want to live for tomorrow, but live today too. So they may say, there are a few different ways around this. If I know what my purpose is, maybe I can get a job that incorporates that purpose. And therefore, I won't mind working for another 30 years because I'm going to be doing something I love and that's good enough. That's one group of people. Another group of people might say, you know what? My job is my job and it makes me money, but I'm not willing to wait to 10 or 15 years to do what I love doing. So I'm going to do that job three quarters of time, or I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a position that pays a little bit less, but that gives me a little more emotional energy. And with that extra emotional energy or time, I'm going to pursue my purpose in ways that maybe I don't make money. And I can go and it might take me till 20 or 30 years from now to retire but I'm going to enjoy this time because instead of working 24 seven, I've cut back enough to start doing these joyful things in the meantime. So there are a bunch of different models for how your finances can look once you understand what feels purposeful to you. And then it's just a matter of what you want to do with your life. But if you don't know what purpose looks like, then you're shooting in the dark. You're just building a financial framework, but you're not sure which choice is best for you because you don't know what the end game is. Instead of uh, work hard, make money, you know, working in itself can be rewarding just for the sense of community you get there, the competence you gain from the experience, which leads to confidence and uh, a whole litany of other benefits that aren't related strictly to the wages or salary you earn. So instead it should be make money, work hard. Uh, so, uh, um, what's next for you? Are you going to uh, write another book, uh, continue to produce uh, more content uh, on your podcast or blog? Uh, what, what, what excites you now? So I've done lots of work on identity and purpose myself on me. And I realize it really struck me. I've been, I'm sorry, what was that? I said, I've been doing a lot of work on purpose and identity myself, and it really recently struck me as my idea of identity has evolved. I Googled myself the other day to look for something and what came up, you know, Google assigns information to you. And what came up at the top is it said, Jordan Grummet writer. And I had so much pride when I saw this, right? It said, Jordan Grummet, I think I actually said author or writer. And I had so much pride when I saw this and I realized that all those years of seeing Jordan Grummet physician, I never had nearly that pride. And so sure. I think a big part of my purpose and identity is to be an author, to write books. And so my goal for the next 10 years is hopefully to write a number of books. So I started with taking stock that led me to my second manuscript, which is in the process of being prepared. It was sold to Harriman house a few months ago, uh, a publisher that I'm very fond of. I think they do a really good job. Um, and that is called the purpose code. And it's all about purpose. It's like the next step from taking stock. It's all about how we get purpose wrong and why it tends to cause us anxiety as opposed to what we know scientifically through the data that it's supposed to, it improves health, happiness, and longevity. But for a lot of people, it doesn't always feel so good. So to answer this paradox, how can it be both so important and yet so anxiety causing? 
I've written a whole book about purpose and how we generally get it wrong and how we can get it right. So that will be out in January of 25. So it's a long editing process through traditional publishing. It's going to take a bit of time, but that's what I'm working on now. But my goal is to put out a series, hopefully three, four or five books over the next 10 years. Um, and to me, that feels a lot like purpose and joy and, and fulfillment. I think it's fantastic. And I'm excited uh, to catch our next book. Can't wait to finish the one uh, I'm reading now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Is there anything we haven't covered that you'd really like to, to share with the audience? Uh, generally, the idea behind the book is called Taking Stock, a Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. The idea really behind it is to ask yourself three questions or, th or go through a three-tiered process. The first is what does purpose and identity look like in your life? The second is to build a financial framework around that. That's finding ind financial independence and fitting that in your life. The book talks a lot more about how you do that. And lastly, asking yourself the big question, am I afraid of dying young and wealthy or am I afraid of living long and running out of money? And if you can answer that question, you can start figuring out how much to spend today versus defer for tomorrow, right? This whole idea of YOLO, you only live once, so I got to spend today because I might die like my father died when he was 40, right? So how do you work in YOLO in case something bad happens versus being careful for your future so you don't end up never retiring or retiring without enough money? And so I think those are like the three processes we should all go through with our money and so that's what the book talks about. You can learn more about it by going to jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. And there you can find out all about the book as well as the different ways I create content, which includes a medical blog, which I don't write at anymore, a financial blog, as well as the Earn and Invest podcast, which is what I spend most of my time doing besides writing books. That's fantastic. And Doc, I uh, really appreciate you coming on to the show. Like I told you earlier, uh, I'm a big fan myself, and I really do appreciate you taking the time. If uh, uh, there's nothing else, I'll respect your time, let you go. We've uh, covered the podcast, where to find you, and if you have anything else to add. Nope, that's it. And just thank you so much for having me on the show. <laughs> thank you. All right. Take care. Awesome. That was a lot of fun. <laughs>